I'm Mike Vardy. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it, and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. And this is the Productivityist Podcast. Welcome to the Productivity is Podcast. I am your host, Mike Vardy, and this week on the show, we're going paperless, but in a way that you might not expect, because we're talking to Brooks Duncan of Document Snap, who has a view on paperlessness that might fly in the face of what you'd think it is. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into the ideas of you know, privacy uh, when it comes to going paperless and the cloud. We're going to talk about how paper can play a role in going paperless, and believe me, paperlessness doesn't keep paper out of the mix. We'll get into that much more during our conversation this week on the show. Let's get into it. Here's my conversation with Brooks Duncan of Document Snap on the Productivity is Podcast. I'd like to welcome Brooks Duncan from Document Snap to the Productivity is Podcast. Brooks, thanks for joining me this week. Oh, thanks for having me. I can't believe you haven't been on the show yet. Nope. I was on Way back in the day, I was on the uh, mic techniques, I believe it was called. Yep. Uh, with you and your former partner in crime. Uh, but no, productivityist, I've, I've managed to avoid it till now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been friends for a number of years, and it's really cool that we, we get the chance to actually do this today. Um, mm. Because, uh, you know, you know, our mutual friend Steve Dotto always gets on my gears about the fact I use paper. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm a fan of the Baron Fig notebooks. I'm a fan of using Post-it products. I like all that stuff, but I'm also digital. I'm, I'm a hybrid. Right. You are the paperless guy, you know, and, and what I love about uh, what you do is that you, you define paperless as something completely different. I think that my audience is going to get a kick out of this if they haven't heard you talk about this already. But I want you to kind of give your version of what paperless productivity or even what just paperlessness means and we'll dive into the productivity component a bit so what does paperless mean to you and what do you how do you you know kind of expound upon that with your with your audience and your clients yeah i mean i've got this this reputation as being mr paperless as you say and uh it's even gotten to the point that one time i was at a at an event and uh, hanging out with some friends and I wanted to make a note of something. And at the time I carried around a field notes notebook. I don't really do that anymore, but at the time I did. So I jotted something down and, and, uh, one of the women I was with gasped and she goes, you're writing on paper. And she actually took a picture of it because <laughs> <laughs> she was so shocked. Um, but yeah, like to me, and, and sometimes I'll even have people write me and they'll say, Oh, Brooks, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I try to go paperless, but I really, you know, I just love using notebooks, let's say, for example. And then I reply, I say, well, first of all, you don't need to apologize to me, but you know, when, when I think of going paperless, I, it's not necessarily about totally eliminating 100% of the paper in your life or your business or whatever, uh, that's probably not going to happen. To me, it's more about the way I think of it is a lot of things, a lot of times we use paper by default, just be just because that it's there. But it's more about being more mindful of the paper that you use, and being more mindful that of the paper that you keep. So if you're, if you prefer using paper for something like I like reading paper books, for example, um, I like digital books like Kindle too, but I like paper, but if it's something that works for you and you like doing, I mean, go for it, but just think to yourself, okay, I'm done writing this down. Now, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to hold on to this paper? And maybe you want to, or would it be better to have it say in a digital format that's not taking up space and searchable later uh, for that long-term storage. It's just kind of finding what works for you. 
So what paper do you, you mentioned paper books? You mentioned like, how did you kind of get to the point where you really decided to explore the paperless world that you're kind of firmly entrenched in now? Yeah, well, I kind of the way it happened, I kind of fell into it, actually. Um, my wife and I were going through this big simplification phase after we had our second son and we lived in this uh you know, kind of big house in one part of Vancouver. And we decided to move to a smaller townhouse in another part of Vancouver. And as we were doing that move, I'm, I'm lugging my big, heavy file cabinet that's stuffed to the stuffed to the gills with paper. I'm just thinking to myself, this is ridiculous. You know, I don't, I don't need 90% of this paper, I'm sure. So I decided at that point, I'm going to go paperless. And I, I had no idea what that meant really at the time. But that's kind of what started my journey. So then I started researching scanners. And um, and I wanted to, you know, being, being a bit of a, a, a geek, as you might say, I, I didn't want to just start scanning stuff. I wanted to do it in the most, you know, efficient and automated way possible. Uh, so that's when I started going down the rabbit hole of this stuff. And over time, it, it wasn't like some switch that I flipped and I decided all of a sudden I'm paperless. It was more first I digitized the documents that I had and then I started looking for other opportunities uh, and and did it that way. I still use paper for some things, for example, right in front of me. I have a piece of paper and I have a pen in my hand right now. And if I'm talking on the phone, I will jot down notes on paper because that works for me. I did tech support for a lot of years. And that's just a, a habit that I got into is writing everything down as I'm talking. Uh, but I don't tend to keep that paper. Now, my wife, on the other hand, uh, she isn't really that interested in digital tools. So one time I came home and she had a printed out Google calendar stuck on stuck on the fridge. And I walked into the kitchen. I'm like, you're killing me here. You're going to totally ruin my reputation if people saw this. <laughs> so it's all about finding what works for you. Where do you think people should start? Because a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll look at their desk and they'll see paper everywhere. Mm. And they'll, the, first off, they won't know what it is. And then secondly, they realize there's a lot of it. So where do you recommend people start when they do this kind of thing? Because it, uh, I found, and I'm sure you have as well, where pe this is especially with tasks and to-do lists, is they throw everything into a task management app and assume it's going to do the work for them. Mm, so it's like, oh, it's yeah. all there now, so it's all digital. But where do you think people should start? So that way they're, they're not going to get overwhelmed with the process of going paperless, which is – Kind of ironic when you think about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so there's a few things I would say. Number one, it can be really helpful to start with the new stuff coming in. So you've got this legacy, maybe like me, you had the bulging file cabinets, or maybe like you say, you have the piles all over the place. I would start just focusing on new paper coming in and getting your system down, however that system's going to work, getting that down first and then tackling the older stuff. Because once you have your system down, starting with the, when you do tackle the older stuff, it'll go a lot faster because you have everything kind of down smoothly. Another good thing is once, once you've done that, focus on the inputs as well. So what I mean by that is, and you can kind of think of it as a funnel, you've got all this paper coming into your life and it can be a really helpful exercise to actually sit down and think to yourself, where is all this paper coming from? Some of it's going to be in the mail. Some of it's going to be, you know, in your kids' backpacks. Some of it's going to be maybe uh, notes that you take or you know, anyone who's worked in an office is probably familiar with that tray that sits beside the printer where people are printing stuff out but never actually picking it up. Where is all this paper coming from? And some of that paper you can just eliminate. Maybe it's getting taken off mailing lists, that sort of thing. So you're eliminating inputs into your life right from the get-go, which is great. From the stuff that's left after that initial weeding out, you can think, okay, some of this paper, maybe it would make more sense if I shifted it to digital. So maybe for some people that's switching to paperless billing or maybe their vendors give them an option of emailing a PDF or a link to a PDF instead of sending paper. Or maybe there's other opportunities to shift that to digital. And then so you're going to eliminate some, some there and then you'll have some paper left over that that 
you have, but at least then you're choosing to use that paper. Like you're controlling the paper. The paper is not controlling you. What happens when you start to add more to the mix? Like, do you, like, you know, for example, you start with the new stuff, you build the framework, which is essentially, we both are talking about the same thing with different principles, really, when mm. it comes to what, what happens when something new gets added to the mix that you didn't expect, you know, like, so for example, you start working with someone who is a paper fiend or mm -hmm. you need to actually have like printed contracts and stuff. Like, how do you, how do you handle the, the input management that's going on here from all this information that you feel that if you don't print it, then it could get lost in the shuffle because as you go paperless, you're going to find that you have to be really organized in that realm as well in the digital space. Like how do you keep it from that, from your digital clutter from becoming just as mess, messy, if not messier, than than the 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 paper clutter you've had in the first place when new things keep coming in. Right. Uh, so there's two parts to that. The first is avoiding that digital clutter, because what will happen a lot of times is we decide we want to go paperless. So we switch to paperless billing, for example, or we start scanning our documents. And then all of a sudden, we've got all these PDFs all over the place on our computer. So the similar way that with paper files, you're going to want to have some sort of organization system. It's the same with digital. Uh, you're going to want to have some sort of organization system, whether it's by category or some other way that works for you, have that organization system set up so that you know how to, when, when you are scanning something or receiving something, it's flexible enough that you have somewhere for this information to go. So that's number one. Number two, you made a, you made a good point about shifting to digital can have some repercussions and and can lead to some other issues that and this is a sticking point for a lot of people especially when it comes to bills for example they'll say oh you know having that phone bill on my desk reminds me that i need to pay it for example yeah it acts, and, as, a, it acts as a trigger yeah yeah and and i totally get that um so that if you are shifting stuff like that to digital that is where interfacing with task management systems becomes very, very helpful. So maybe what you want to do in that case, if it's something that you know is going to be due at a certain time every month, instead of using that trigger, that instead of using that bill on your desk as the trigger, have it on your calendar, say, you know, pay MasterCard every at a certain time every month. Or another way to go is when you receive the notification from your bank or whatever that this bill is due, then that goes on a task in your trusted task management system, pay bill due October 31st or whatever. Right. So it, it, it's like any other task really, but I like for me, I, I'm not a fan of the, the bill on the desk as a trigger because if something happens, if, uh, you're tired one day and you throw a pile of paper on top of that bill, all of a sudden that trigger is gone. So I actually like it the digital way better using my trusted systems that I already trust for other things. I, I prefer that to me, that's a bit more reliable, but everybody works differently, of course. Right, right. Now let's talk about the idea of Getting things from, okay, so you're, you, I mean, I'm a big paper guy when it comes to like, uh, I almost use these as like satellite entries. So for for example, right now during, like you, I'm taking notes using pen and paper. I've got my, you know, my, my, my notebooks and stuff in front of me. Um, do you have a frame, like a framework or some kind of system in place that you kind of say, okay, here's how, like, what is your sample workflow to get it from paper to digital? And then make sure that it can, like, whether it's using technology or otherwise, you know, whether you, what apps you use, whatever, that allows you to say, okay, here's a sample note. Here's where in this instance, so let's say show notes, which is what I'm using right now, making links. Mike, here's how I would take it from the paper form to the digital form so that you can really leverage it later. Like, walk me through that process uh, using some of the tools that you recommend. Sure. I, I've tried different things over the year. Uh, I, I've, when I was when I was 
quote unquote going paperless, I, I tried to take it all the way where I would even decide, I decided I'm not going to take notes on paper anymore. I'm going to use a stylus and my iPad and try writing on that. And I think the tools weren't quite there yet. Maybe it's a bit different with, say, I've, I've heard good things about writing on, for example, the iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil. Mm -hmm. I've never tried that myself. I've heard good things about that. And I have, I, I do know people who do take notes that way uh, and, it, and it works well for them. It, it just wasn't right for me, maybe because I'm a weird left-handed person and and uh, the tools aren't made for us. I, I'm not no, sure what it was. No, they're not made for me. I'm a lefty too. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm not sure what it was. So um what and then I've also experimented with, OK, I'm not going to write. I'm going to type because I'm a fast I'm a, actually these days I'm a faster typer than a writer. And that's great for some things. But I find if my attention's divided, uh, just jotting notes down on paper works well for me. So what what happens after that is I like. I like to capture it on paper, whether it's in a notebook or on, you know, just loose paper at my desk or whatever. And then what I personally will do is I will scan that usually using if I'm at my desk beside my scanner, I'll use my scanner. If I'm not, I'll usually use my my smartphone. In my case, it's an iPhone. And I like capturing what works well for me is I like capturing information. Uh, I use Evernote for that. So what I'll do is I will write things on paper. I'll use, um, I tend to use an app called Scannable for capturing handwritten notes. That's made by Evernote. It's just a fast and easy way to capture things to Evernote. Uh, the built-in document scanner in Evernote is very good as well. And so I will capture those to Evernote. And Evernote actually has pretty good, I mean, I know Evernote has had some challenges over the years uh, lately, but I find for for this particular use case, it still works really well. Evernote does very good um, handwriting recognition, surprisingly good, I would say. Uh, so what I will do is I will capture it. I tend to tag it if it's an event or something like that. I'll give it a tag and then it's there in Evernote if I ever need it. Uh, I've also heard good things. I'm not a OneNote user personally, but I've heard really good things about doing a similar thing, capturing paper. Uh, using uh, an app called Office Lens, which is made by Microsoft, and capturing that to, to OneNote. So that's another option if you're if you're on the kind of Windows OneNote side of the fence. Okay, cool, cool. Now, what about? Let's, I want to talk a bit about Evernote because I know you and I have used Evernote for a long time. You've got a class with Steve Dotto, right? Evernote mm -hmm. made easy, right? Um, I, I've had the uh, way back uh, the the former. Um, former, uh, I think he's the, and I'm going to screw this up, but Andrew, who was, was worked at Evernote was one of the higher ups there. Mm. Um, he was on the show and we talked about some of the changes that happened back then. Why do you think, and this is not a, a, a slam against Evernote at all because I use it, but why do you think they're, they're getting such a hard time? Is it because they were the only game in town and they were doing things in a way that people like, like the free options were fantastic. And now they're trying to make money and, and keep the thing, you know, going strong. That's my opinion on it. Um, but why do you think they're having a, t a tougher go of it lately than they have in the past, in your opinion? Again, not knowing anything on the inside or whatnot. Right. Yeah. And, and same thing. Like I have no... I don't, I don't have somebody inside that I chat to about this stuff. Yeah, so this exactly. Is, same, same as you. This is just my outside observation. Uh, I think I think you hit on a lot of it. I think they were the the main game for a long time. They didn't really have too many natural competitors. And so they were able to grow to a really big scale. Uh, and I think there was kind of two problems that went on at the same time. And maybe these problems allowed them to get to the scale. I don't know. But number one, I think the company lost a lot of focus. So they would launch these other, these other kind of unfocused apps. Uh, and also they would start, you know, they started selling socks and wallets and backpacks and, you know, all that sorts of stuff that you'd look at it and, and they would, they would kind of justify this stuff in a way, but you'd think, is that really what you guys are supposed to be doing right now? So that was problem number one. I think they they took their eye off the ball a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But problem number two, going back to what you said about needing to make money, they also took a ton of funding uh, to enable them to grow and scale. But, uh, you know, if, if somebody's going to invest money in, in you, eventually they're going to want to start getting some of this back. Right. So so, you know, there's been change in management. And I think the changes that they've been making are good, whether you agree with the there was a recent price increase, whether you agree with that price increase or not. I think the the renewed focus on on uh, their actual note taking and central Evernote application. So they've kind of doubled down their focus on that. They've recognized that a lot of people want to use Evernote in conjunction with other services. So instead of trying to make Evernote do everything, they've now made it so it, it can uh, interface with Google Drive, for example, because there are some, if somebody's working, for example, with large files, maybe Evernote's right, not the place for those. So they're, they're not ignoring everything else. They're focusing on that. Uh, and they 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 got rid of the marketplace and a lot of that stuff. So I think I, I'm still a believer in Evernote. I'm still a user uh, and I still like the product, but they're not the only game in town anymore. Uh, so that it's probably good for them too. Some competition is probably good for them. I want to talk about other options a little bit later in the Patreon component. So for Patreon sure. listeners, they're going to be able to hear a bit more about other options. But I want to dive back into the the notebook space. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot more of these digital slash analog hybrid notebooks. Mm -hmm. um, things like Slice Planner and uh, interesting new technology like the rocket, uh, the rocket planner, you know, the rocket wave where it's a microwavable planner where basically, uh, you could take pictures of it. You've got notes, but then basically what you do is if you want to erase it, you microwave it and it <laughs> erases. I don't know if you've seen this. No, I haven't seen but, that one. <laughs> um, they're, they're meshing digital and they're, and, uh, and analog. What do you think about? these kind of tools. And again, I, I, I mean, I'm kind of catching off guard a little bit because you haven't seen some of these, but you, I'm sure you've seen products out there that are like, okay, mm -hmm. how do we merge? Evernote did it for a while, you know, with the yep. Moleskin and, and mm -hmm. they still do. Um, they've got the post-it notes, uh, you know, and all that. Yep. What do you think about these hybrid solutions that um, are, do they, do, are they something that people could, do you think they're going to be, they're going to have a permanent place or do you think that they are almost like a transitional thing for people who are, analog only and this is going to make them more comfortable with with the tech tools that are available like what are your thoughts on these i think they're great personally i think i think they really recognize exactly what we were talking about that there used to be you almost used to feel like there was this false choice digital or paper uh but they recognize i think that people don't really work that way uh people jot things down people capture things digitally people um yeah like the note the post-it notes in evernote for example so they inst but but it's kind of it can be kind of a pain to go from one world to the next so i you know i described how i how i write jot things down and scan them in for example a lot of people don't want to have to do all that so i think it i think they're great that they they recognize that it needs to be a easier for people to to have a foot in both worlds so yeah i'm uh, I, I think they're awesome cool i mean I, i've been looking at more of them because i think that you've got these people out there that are trying to manage both of these spaces and they're trying to get into the digital world but they're so i mean bullet journal is a great example of just a pure analog system but mm. there are some complexities behind it that i find uh that you know there's something certain things that digital does better than paper, you know, search is obviously mm -hmm. a big one. What do you find that? What what are you? What do you find that that the benefits of digital will allow you to do if you've got this framework in place beyond search? And then let's talk about some of the tools that allow for you to to have that kind of functionality almost through automations and stuff. So I mean, some that come to mind, I'm sure you know, like text expander and things like that, mm -hmm. like. What what are the benefits that you, that you see that that digital has right out of the box that people who are in this analog world that are planning on going as 
in terms of paperless as you define it, where do you, like, how do you think they can leverage the digital space so that they're, they find it more useful and more comforting to use? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, so, so benefits, uh, searches is, is the obvious one. Um, you know, we, if you want to find information, you've got to dig through your notebooks or your books or whatever, to, or your file cabinets to find it where if, if things are searchable and, uh, and indexed, it, it can make things much faster to find. Other benefits for me are just physical space. And this isn't so much with notebooks, but for other things, you know, just recently I was, I read this really interesting biography of John D. Rockefeller and uh, called Titan. And the thing, I really enjoyed it, but I read it in paper format and I regretted it the whole time because the thing is weighs 50 pounds and is huge. So I'm dragging this thing around in my backpack thinking, oh, I wish I'd put this on my Kindle. Right. And, and, uh, like I said, the example with my file cabinet, you know, I, I, I had this bulging file cabinet where eventually I digitized 90% of it. And so what used to take up a space in my office is now a few megabytes or a few gigabytes on my hard drive, taking up no physical space. The other, the other benefit for me is, and this is what I used to find with my field notes when I did that is I always have, I tend to always have my phone with me, for example, or a tablet or something. But if I don't have my notebook, then I, I don't have a lot of information that I, that I wanted to have. So for me, it's that ubiquity. Uh, if you have things digital and synchronized to some sort of cloud system, you can get to that information from anywhere, from any device right. where if you don't have your notebook, you don't have your, your notebook. So that, that's what has kind of worked well for me. As far, sidebar, sidebar yeah, no. real quick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cause I find this, I mean, I carry notebooks with me wherever I go. Right. Mm -hmm. Which we do. But why I, I, and I also have my phone with me, my devices. I think that for me, capturing in paper when mm. things are happening is more beneficial to me yep. than putting them in the digital form. Mm. But digital is better for me for reviewing, researching all that stuff. So I won't necessarily pull my phone out all the time, sometimes to write down a task or a note yep. or an idea. But my notebook does that because I'm disconnected from the rest of the stuff that's on my devices, like email or Slack or whatever. Yep. Do, you, do you find you run into that problem when you're opening up? You're like, if you don't have a notebook with you, you grab your phone, and you're like, oh, look, I've received five emails or I've got a Slack <laughs> message or whatever. And it kind of derails you. Uh, I don't. F I, or are I you disciplined? Say, are you disciplined uh, enough that it's not as an issue for you anymore? I was starting to say I don't really have that problem, but it's probably not true. I think I I don't think there's a way unless you're somebody who unless you're you're somebody who basically has all notifications turned off and you know maybe a pristine home screen with just your your capture, which you know maybe some of your listeners are this way. Right. Uh, it, it, you're right. You're you're definitely right about that. There are there are on the flip side of all the benefits of digital, I said, there, you know, there are benefits of paper and what you described is one of them. You're not tempted to, you know, you don't go to jot down a capture an important thought and then you find five minutes later, you're scrolling through your Facebook feed, uh, you know, seeing what your high school friends are up to, you know, mm -hmm. that that is something that using notebooks definitely helps with for sure. Let's let's go back to what you're you're dying into diving into though. I didn't mean to derail you there. Oh, it's no, just no, it was no. something that I that I caught. I'm like I want to address this before it before it goes away. No, no, no. It's good. Uh, I, I I think the 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 main thing I was going to say is, and and this is one of the benefits of of having a capture system if you are going to use digital, because there's there are a lot of of apps and applications that. And this was especially true in the early days of these digital tools is, you know, you jot down notes or you you capture a, a document or a receipt or something like that. And then it just lives in the app on your device. And and nowadays, I think there's a lot of benefit for these capture apps that in the background will upload them to a cloud service, whether it's a cloud service managed by that app or, you know, sending things to 
Google Drive or, or OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever you're using to synchronize or Evernote, whatever you're using. Because then, but you don't want to have to physically do it. You want it to just work in the background. Okay, so that brings up another point is the privacy and security issues that come with going purely digital. Mm. Now, I mean, you're right. Someone could go in and grab your file cabinet and take it and then they have everything. But the cloud, there are, I mean, there's been some holes found in the cloud. You know, we're hearing a lot of it with, you know, as we're recording this, you know, the election down in the United States, <laughs> yeah. all that stuff, right? So what mm-hmm. do you say about the security concerns about going paperless? Yeah, uh, well, so despite everything I just said, it it's totally your option whether you want to even upload things to the cloud. Mm-hmm. So, for example, what some people choose to do is they are, they want to go paperless, but these things live on their local device or their internal network or something like that, and it never goes to the cloud. So that's a totally – there's a lot of benefits for that. There's – you know, I can't sit here and, and say – if you upload to the cloud, there's no chance that your data could be hacked because nobody can make that <laughs> that guarantee. Right. Uh, that being said, there are some things you can do. Uh, one thing you definitely want to do, in my opinion, is if you're storing information that you wouldn't want others to see. You know, like I said, step one, maybe don't even put on the cloud. But step two, if you if you want those benefits, is you want to use a cloud provider that encrypts your data at rest. Most of them do these days, but not all of them. Uh, for example, Evernote does not. So that's something to be aware of, at least at the time of recording. They, they don't. Uh, and there are some cloud services that, uh, not to get too technical, but there are some cloud services that will not only encrypt your data at rest, but you hold the encryption keys. So even if somebody some rogue IT person w- was snooping and wanted to find this information, uh, you know, they, they can't do it theoretically uh, because you have the keys. So those so, are options. So let's talk about like two popular things, like password managers would be a great example. But remember, that I think Ellen had a segment where she had a notebook someone could get. It was called the, the little book of passwords or wherever it was. And it's like, this is good. So you've got a password book for your passwords that says passwords on it that thieves could just come and take and they have all it. But, you know, there's tools like 1Password and LastPass. Would those be, uh, you know, tools or apps? Do you know if they have those qualities? Because that's something that, I mean, getting someone to use a service like 1Password, which I do as well when I'm working mm-hmm. with them, um, can be a challenge because they're like, well, why? I, I, you know, I just have this 1Password that I use all the time. What's the difference? Once they see the benefit of it, sure. But, what do you like do do these services uh, especially especially these two do they provide that kind of stability and security they're definitely encrypted at rest that's for sure um and i think that that you bring up actually a really good point about these type of password services uh or password management in general because you could you could choose the most secure fort knox cloud services with uh you know, with every person, every possible security benefit, completely unhackable, if that's even a thing, which it's not. But let's just pretend your your data is stored in this completely unhackable system. But if you're not practicing good password protection, so for example, using two-factor authentication where it's available and using good password practices like not reusing passwords, all that security doesn't matter because a lot of times when we hear about a service being quote unquote hacked, a lot of times the service hasn't been hacked. It's that somebody has tricked somebody into giving up their password or they find their password from a system that was hacked and then reuse it on another system. So it's really, really important if you're going to be storing stuff in a cloud service to use good password practices. So Brooks, you've, put together this really cool new thing that uh, we just talked about as we, we started off the show. Um, and it's nice that we kind of brought it privacy into the equation. Can you talk a little bit about this, uh, this new paperless security guide that you've got ready to go? Yeah, uh, this, this podcast is actually good timing because I'm just launching, I've just launched 
version two of my paperless security guide because I would get a lot of questions about exactly what you're asking. You know, how do, how do I keep my documents safe and secure? And there's a lot of different things you want to look at when it comes to that. Backups, which, uh, which are super important. Some people, which we didn't even touch on, uh, want their documents to be encrypted. So what that means is so if somebody were to get access to your documents, they still can't read them. And uh, there's other security things you can do. So I kind of assembled it all into one guide. And so I launched it over a year ago and it was very well received, but people had some additional questions. You know, I would talk about, for example, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I would talk about backing up your documents, but I didn't really touch on what to do if you need to get your back, your documents back. Mm. So people would say, uh, Brooks, what about restoring? So I held up my hand. I said, yep, that's my bad. So I ha have a, a lot more detail in this version too about all the ways you go through backing up in the most efficient way and also how to get the information you need back to recover it. And then I have uh, added a bunch of other stuff as well. So if, if you're kind of interested in this idea of going paperless or you're just interested in computer security in general, it may be worth a while checking out because I kind of collected all my best advice into this one little guide. Awesome. Awesome. Let's, uh, let's wrap things up here. Brooks, where can people find you and your work online? So that way they're, you know, they're going to be able to go paperless the way they really should, or at least the way that they could start going paperless and you can help them along with their journey. Yeah, you can find me at documentsnap.com. That's that's my website. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at documentsnap. That's my business one. Or Brooks Duncan is my personal one. If you want to watch me talking about soccer or hockey or making fun of my kids or whatever. Uh, and yeah, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions anyone has. Awesome. Thanks again so much for joining me this week, Brooks. Yeah, thanks for having me. And that about does it for this week's episode of the Productivity is Podcast. Do you want to learn about what we talked about during the show and dive deeper into the world of going paperless? First off, head over to documentsnap.com. Brooks has got some great stuff there, but all the links we talked about are in the show notes, and you can learn more about that going there and all the different things that we talked about. Uh, there's a lot there. Uh, if you want to get even more from us, uh, and from the show, we do have a Patreon edition of the show, and we went over backups and, and more specific tools that you can use to go paperless. We, we dove a little bit deeper, as we do in every single episode that goes out to my Patreon supporters only. So if you want to learn more about that, head over to patreon.com slash productivityist, and you can support the show starting today. You can also help the show out by giving us a rate or review. That is a rating or review in iTunes uh, that will help us make the show even better. I, I get all the feedback and I learn what I can do better and what you, you like, what you don't like. And it really does help make the show better week in and week out. Big thanks to John Polster for putting this show together this week. Uh, we now have show notes that are being taken care of as well. So again, we're, we're, we're leveling up the show and I'm glad that you joined me for the ride, whether it's just for this episode or for many episodes leading up to this point. Thanks again for listening. I'm your host, Mike Vardy, reminding you, stop guessing and start going.